Well podcast. This is a takeover episode. We are at the International Play Association Conference, one of the sessions for Professor Jaffe answering questions from children around the world. Here are some bonus questions. My name is Tam Bailey and I'm the chair of the steering group for the IPA conference. And I'm Philip uh, Jaffe. I'm a member of the Committee on the Rights of the Child, and I'm really happy to have this conversation with you, Tom. Okay, lovely. Uh, and what we're doing is we're catching up on some of the questions that were um, not able to be asked yesterday mm. uh, because of just the hundreds and hundreds of questions that are missing. Yeah. And it's yeah. wonderful. It's wonderful to actually have so many questions coming from children across the globe. So this is a chance for catch up. And if the children get a chance, make sure that you see the recording of uh, Philip. Uh, when he was answering questions yesterday. I'll do my best. Okay, so here we go. One of the questions that came in from uh, Elner in Houston was, why do children have to work? It's not right. They should be able to learn and grow without having any disruption. Absolutely, and children should not work. If they do work, it should be only in a very limited capacity. And most countries have pretty stringent rules around this. Unfortunately, even in developed countries, we're seeing an uptick in child labor, even in developed countries, the United Kingdom as well, but the U.S. is really an outlier in the worst sense of the term. So we really have to go back to our basic protection and make sure that children are mostly in school, mostly having fun and not working. Okay. And that's relevant for children right across the globe as well. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. So here's another one. This is all about growing up. There's three questions here asked by different children. So are grown-ups allowed to play? That's from Xander. There's a second one, which do adults play the same types of games as children? That's from Paulette. And another one from Paulette is, are kids' games more fun than adult games? Mm. Those are all great questions. I'll take the last one first. Um, I I do think that uh, children's games are more fun than adults' games. And I'll tell you why. Because the smiles and the laughs that come out of children when they're playing just gives it away. Um, I don't see any adults uh, at the same level of contentment as children. So having said that, uh, adults have different games and um, they serve the same function, basically, which is to challenge them, to occupy them and um, uh, to, to create relations. And uh, But they're more serious in general and their rules are a bit more complicated. What, what's nice about children is that they have spontaneous games. Because they bend the rules. They adapt on, on the spot to different uh, ideas that come out of the group, which adults do not do. Okay, that's great. So just to continue that theme, there's a question here from Karine who says, does pretending you have a crown in your head, is that playing? <laughs> There's also a left field question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, having a crown on your head is... Um, is playing to your imagination and uh, it's a game within your own mind and you're probably thinking that you're some sort of royal prince of, of some kind and um, it's absolutely a game and it uh, falls into this uh, category of symbolic play which is basically um, through an object or just through imagination you're transporting into a non-real situation. Okay, this might have been covered already but Paul is asking, can you invent new games? All the time, all the time. You know, that's a really good question because um, children invent their own games, which every other child has invented before, but they each think that they've invented a new game. And that's that's perfect because it's a process also to, to play and to, to discover that you can be creative. And But there are all kinds of new games that come up. And, and by the way, there are also many games that we forget about. Mm-hmm. So there's a, there's a window of... The games being present at any given time, the ones that are lost in history and the new ones that are coming up. One of the things we've been interested in, this is about uh, is, uh, having a museum mm. uh, of play, uh, which I think hopefully would capture you know, all of those different games through the ages in different countries. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of uh, creating a museum, what I found just really fascinating uh, researching this a few years back is that one of the oldest games is uh, Spinning Talk. Mm-hmm. And the spinning top is an interesting uh, g- a game or something that you play with because it defies the rules of physics in a way. And this is so interesting to see that children are fascinated by how the natural world operates. And there's also a very famous picture of two Nobel Prizes looking at a spinning top operate. Ah. <laughs> so you can see the, the link between a child's play and understanding the world and the universe and the laws of physics. Yeah. So, again, we talk about building blocks for children, but it, it really has 
the direct connection to knowledge. So this is about uh, children's right to play. Walters asked, why do children play if they don't have a right to? Well, children play even though the adults around them may think, uh, say that they don't have a right because they can't help but play. And uh, this is something that many adults don't realize is that you cannot interdict or prohibit a child from playing. You can, and you can do all kinds of things to weaken his capacity to play or put barriers up. But it's such a fundamental, spontaneous need of children um, and the human mind that uh, you can't uh, you can't really uh, control it. I'm going to move on to Lucette Li, Li Yu. Uh, he's from Taiwan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she's, she's asking, why don't adults allow children to speak up their opinions, raise questions, or simply provide funny responses, e.g. jokes to questions in classes? Mm-hmm. It's the teachers who want us to give answers. Why don't they just like any responses, but only responses they like? I think that's get, getting at to uh, uh, listening to children's opinions. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's amazing. I mean, adults um, favor children who are formatted in many ways to answer the way they expect them to. We should encourage adults and teachers to um, accept that children have funny ways of answering questions, seeing things, and uh, that all their opinions are important, however they are expressed. And You know, we have Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child that says that children's opinions are should be listened to uh, on all matters that concern them directly or indirectly. But that also uh, should include opinions that are off track or very um, creative or not quite what we expect. And I find many adults are pretty dismissive of children who don't uh, fit into a specific form of exchange. And it's really too bad because some, I, I'm sure there's some pearls in there that we're missing and, um, and we're killing spontaneity. And that kid may think that his, I'm, I'm sorry I'm being a little bit long here, but, but I do think it's very important that uh, many children's um, path to adult spontaneity are is stifled by this attitude of, of adults that uh, squash them immediately. So we have to keep a very open mind as uh, adults and not always understand what the children are telling us, but yeah, you know, it's interesting. What, whatever they meant, it's fun and it's interesting. And it, in class as well. Okay, that's great. So here's another one. Here's another one on education. A bit mm. simpler this question, but I think I know what it's getting at. Can we not have any homework, but only schoolwork? Oh, I'm sure that's a and kid from South Asia somewhere. It is actually, it's Jinti Shen, who's mm. 11 years old, from Taiwan. Yeah. So there, there's several uh, states uh, that the Committee on the Rights of the Child interacts with in a very forceful manner because we know that these kids um, have very little free time. Not even necessarily time to play, just free time. And um, they, they go from school to after school to post after school and their days of um, formal learning just never end. And they complain about it bitterly, And uh, but it, they, they run up against cultural norms and uh, government programming and so on and so forth. So um, I think the, the solution is to push these countries to adopt what's been done in uh, Finland, for example. All the school work is done within the school. There's no homework. And uh, at the same time, to limit the hours and but it's a challenge to convince these countries to uh, change their policies. Yeah, it's a very strong plea from children very to strong. have proper time to yeah. play and not always be under under an expectation of education. Yeah, yeah. and you know, the, I mean, these uh, these kids, um, and, and it's demonstrated in many uh, evidence-based research, I mean, these kids uh, do show very high levels of stress, anxiety, um, uh, psychosomatic uh, disorders, and uh, also... These are the countries where a teenage uh, suicidal behavior is uh, way up there. Yeah. Uh, not that any uh, any country escapes this, but these the, the levels are very high. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay, so here's a one about age. It comes from a school setting, though, uh, and it's from Aboa, who's 10. And it says, why do adults presume school playgrounds are only for one graders to two graders only? Why can't three to six graders go to playgrounds too, but are only allowed in sports fields or ball games? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I, it, I guess it depends where you are, but some, uh, some playgrounds are definitely uh, geared to very young children and uh, I do think that we should be careful not to segregate by age categories and we should be inclusive. It's not only the age, but uh, 
children with disabilities or from different neighborhoods. And so playgrounds should be uh, all inclusive and um, as much as possible cater to a wide spectrum of children. Um, of course, there's a certain, you, you don't want to mix toddlers with teenagers too much, uh, but why not? I mean, it, it could be a different area of the playground and, uh, you know, children are children from zero to 18 and, uh, uh, Tam, you and I were older children. <laughs> we, we should also be able to join in in playgrounds from time to time. Yeah. And we learn a lot when we uh, can spend time in well, the playground. Enough, I go back to playgrounds because my grandchildren now. There you are. So, so, and I have a go in the swings. That's what we call the circle of life. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's just great fun. I'd love to play with you in a sandbox one of these days. <laughs> so the design of playgrounds is, uh, is a really hot topic. And I think... Um, We've uh, moved into a phase where we understand that playgrounds have to be very diverse and they have to be co-designed uh, to some extent by children and uh, teens and so on. What's interesting, and I think these kids are getting at, is that playgrounds are pretty um, bare-bone sort of structures, sort of projections of adult minds where you park children and keep them occupied. And on the what they really should be are areas of intense stimulation and fun and you know the f playground of the future the ideal playground I, I don't really know what it will be maybe it will integrate digital environment maybe it will include music maybe it will I, my favorite playground and i shared this earlier um, would also be one that includes uh, water pistols that we can uh, but most adults wouldn't want that to happen i mean that uh, have their kids soaked in winter or during cold weather. But uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing how poor um, playgrounds are compared to what we could imagine them to be. And it's also a matter of cost, of course. Okay. And actually, I should say that Kuan Kuan also asked a very similar question about challenging playgrounds. But we'll move on from that because mm -hmm. I think you've already covered that. So here we are. You're on the final stick. Here's a question from Dorothy. So you'll expect it to be um, at left field. And she said, what's your favourite colour? My favorite color, yes. Uh, no, it, it's an easy one, um, and but I can't explain why it is. Uh, blue is uh, my favorite color. Maybe it has to do with the fact that, that my mother always played up my blue eyes, and so it's maybe a bit of a narcissistic answer. But uh, I, I do think blue is a beautiful color, blue of the sky, blue of the ocean. And yeah, it's uh, it's nice. Okay. And just for the record, mine's purple. Really? <laughs> yeah, why is that? Why? Uh, and I, I, I you never think of these things. Huh? Yeah, it's, it's weird, actually. You know. Anyway, but uh, I, you see, that's that's an uh, real quick. <laughs> that's a really interesting question because it's a preoccupation of hers, but we don't know why it is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but it must be important to her. Huh? And here's a question from Zi Ang Li uh, in Taiwan and it says, most children in poor countries of the world spend their time as child laborers. We in developed countries like Taiwan cannot imagine or help as individuals or as members of organizations. Can the UN change the situation for those children so they can have their rights like we do? I would love the UN to be able to make a huge difference, uh, but we're working very hard at this. We know that there are about 200 plus 250 million children who are uh, engaged in what we call the worst forms of child labor. And um, it's it's tragic. It really is. And these kids are not only not in school, not learning, not having fun, but they're exposed to very dangerous forms of labor. And they, they're injured, maimed, and some uh, die. So there's a lot of going. We know where they are mostly. Um, and there's a lot of uh, work being done by um, ILO, uh, International Labor Organization, and uh, UNICEF. Um, but we're running into uh, structural child labor, which is linked uh, to uh, poverty and inequality. And so the solution, I think, is to uh, radically engage around poor children and supplemental income and bring them up through other means than this way their families and communities operate because they'll always have to work to eat and have the family uh, sufficiently uh, uh, sufficient income for them to survive. Okay, thank you. It's just on that, resting on that uh, issue of poverty, you've heard from the UK, 25% of our children are living yeah. in, in poverty, and that's been the case for more than 20 years. Um, and so we've got a shock and complacency, a 
about that. Do you think we'll ever be able to realise children's rights as long as we have such high levels of child poverty? I don't think so. I, I, I don't think um, because 25 percent is one in four kids, and I actually heard uh, in Glasgow um, more than that, 40 percent, quasi 40 percent. And in my country, Switzerland, which is one of the two or three most rich countries in the world, it's about 10 percent. And I do think that um, unless our governing structures understand that if we don't address this head on, there's no real meaning to human rights, uh, not just child rights, but human rights. These are kids that are not only suffering from the poverty, but don't have opportunities um, and are put through the ringer in terms of um, just being human and uh, not uh, experiencing well-being, I mean, basic well-being. So, yeah, human rights, ch children's rights cannot be realized until we really hit all of those kids with uh, solutions. When we talk about zero poverty rates in the future. I don't see us doing that or, or working our tails off to, to reach that. And that's a big shame. It's, and and it, it, it haunts me in many ways. Okay, coming to the next question. And this is from a seven-year-old in Canada who is wondering why children cannot work. Yeah. You know, we had an earlier question that said, uh, where we talked about having to protect children from working too much. But uh, children um, are also um, engaged with adults uh, as models, and they see adults working. And for them, it may also be fun to do some of the chores and tasks that adults do. And we should not discourage that on the uh, except when it's over, an overburden and, um, and the harmful. And, and, and again, children need protection. But there's nothing against introducing children to work. And I remember my boy at four years old who loved to have tools that he could walk around with and parade, even though he didn't know how to use them. But it's something about work that, that is fascinating. And I, and I think it's healthy in a way to be able to imagine yourself working. Uh, and it's, for them, it's a form of fun. Okay, good one. So I'm going to run these questions together because it's all about uh, how much children get to play. So Miguel's asking, why can't we play more? Zoe's asking, don't all kids get to play? And Lily's asking, why do we have to stay inside when it rains? Oh, well, um, yeah, the, I guess um, children are always confronting us to the limitations that we put on, um, on play and... Uh, it would be ideal, of course, to, to play as much as we wanted. But I've asked many children, well, if you didn't have to go to school uh, and you could play all day, what would you do? And most of them said, well, I'd go and see my friends at school or uh, I'd be bored after a while or I need uh, some guidance from adults. So, so again, I mean, um, the children are rubbing up against limitations because it's always they always hear that it's time to go and do some serious homework or to do their chores and play as a limited uh, time. But um, w we should not discourage them from uh, from uh, questioning why they can't play more. And uh, for, for again, for sure, there are many children who play very little, and that those they're. they're their demands are totally legitimate. Okay. I think you may have covered this, but do you play? Uh -huh. And how do you play? And that's from Dorothy. Mm. Dorothy is, uh, has asked really some tough, tough <laughs> questions, and, um, and she has a very playful mind with adults. So, yeah, I play a lot. Um, I play a lot in my mind. I have all kinds of, uh, of um, stories that I construct and, and elaborate in my mind. So it's very play with words a lot as well. Um, and now I have uh, younger children who are 11 and 14. So it's uh, boys and they're very um, combative and physical. So we, uh, we shove each other a lot, around a lot. So various play, different ways of playing. But um, to, to answer Dorothy also, um, I, I grew up uh, very much uh, in, uh, in the savannah of East Africa and played a lot alone. So I, I feel very comfortable with myself, maybe not autistic, but I, I can stay busy in my mind and have fun very much. Okay, great. And I'm going to leave the last question to, to Dorothy. Again? Um, yeah. <laughs> and she says, why are kids important? Oh, yeah. 
Oh, why are kids important? Um, you know, the standard answer is that um, they're, they're just um, precious and uh, cute and uh, they're the future of our society. But, but I think it, it's, it goes beyond that. I think uh, kids are important because they remind us of what we were before we became what we are. And in many sense, in, in many ways, uh, kids are important because we see in them the full potential and we want to preserve that because we see that as a possibility of better versions of ourselves. They're not spoiled. They teach us how we should guide our own future and the future of coming up, generations coming up uh, to uh, improve our, our environment and our society. So they are just essential uh, for, yeah, the future of how we move up and better and more respectful of others. And we, they just teach us all the time. Philip, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Tam, thanks for the questions. And um, Dorothy has to has <laughs> I have a lot to answer for. <laughs> <laughs> great. That was great. For more information about the International Play Association, please visit their website, ipaworld.org. Or for more information about Play Scotland, visit our website, playscotland.org. Thanks for listening to our podcast. 